Uh, the uh, chapter we're up to is chapter nine, uh, much uh, shorter and easier, I should say, than the previous uh, two chapters. Uh, the um, We finished uh, learning about the uh, celebration of uh, the Jewish people uh, after having completed the Beis Amigdash. They celebrated, it says it was 14 days celebration, seven days and another seven days. And uh, the reason it divides it in two was because there were seven days of celebrating celebrating the completion of the Beis Hamikdash, and then the other seven days celebration was the holiday of Sukkot, and so uh, they were back to back. Of course, one of the lessons is that you can't make a wedding on a holiday because you would be minimizing the joy. And in other words, Ein Ma'arvin Simcha Besimcha. We don't combine two joyous things together because then one of them would be diminished. So we had seven days and seven days. And uh, another idea behind that about the seven days and seven days is that seven is a number of complete completion, completeness. And uh, so a full seven days uh, and another seven days is like something that uh, symbolizes uh, two sets of complete celebration. And just like a Sheva Brachas is a seven-day celebration after a wedding, there's seven days, so they had seven days of the um, holiday uh, and completion of the Beis Amigdash. So each one was a seven-day celebration, so therefore the, the verse calls it seven days and seven days. And uh, as we mentioned, they they didn't fast on Yom Kippur, and uh, one of the um, uh, uh, verses at the end of chapter eight uh, mentions that a heavenly uh, uh, a uh, uh, or one of the the I should say the interpretation in one, one of the verses is that uh, there was a heavenly voice that called out and said. All of you are ready to, to for the world to come, even though you ate on Yom Kippur, because they were celebrating. Uh, in that year, they got a message that they should eat on Yom Kippur, but they were still nervous. You know, sometimes, you know, it, it sounds okay, but, uh, but you know, the fact is you feel a little guilty. And so they had that feeling of, oh, you, you know, we, we, we ate on Yom Kippur. Maybe we shouldn't have. Maybe it wasn't right. So a voice, a heavenly voice, a baskoil, it's called, came out and said, you're all mezumen l'chaye ha'olam haba. You're all fit for the world to come. You're all invited, so to speak, for the world to come, which basically means that they're forgiven for eating on Yom Kippur. And uh, uh, that it was uh, acceptable what they did, that they, because of the, uh, the, 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 the message they got was correct that they should eat and, and rejoice, and um, and so that was the end of chapter eight, and now we're up to chapter nine, and here the uh, the chapter begins that it happened when Solomon had finished building the temple of Hashem and the king's palace and every desire of Shloima that he wished to make, so. Shlomo Melch finished building Hashem's house and his palace and all the other desires that he wanted, that he had, that he uh, had a desire for. Um, and uh, the verse is referring to what? What does it mean? All the desires it refers to he finished making all the enhancements that he uh, enhanced in the. Beis Hamikdash and in his palace, so all the cheshek, all of his desires, it's adding the uh, that he did a lot of finish touches, finishing touches, and enhancements on these buildings. And uh, verse two is that Hashem appeared to Shlomo a second time, as he appeared to him at Givain. And uh, in the Hebrew, it says, Vayera Hashem al Shloimei Shainis. <laughs> so what does this mean? This was the second time that Hashem appeared to him. So what we, what we understand is that Shloimei HaMelech 
got a second prophecy. When it says here a second, it means this was a prophecy. The first one, if we remember, it had to do with God asking, uh, Hashem asked uh, Shlomo, what would you like? What blessing would you like? And that was in chapter 3. And uh, Shlomo Hamel said that he would like wisdom. That's what he, and Hashem was very happy that he asked for that. He said, I'm giving you everything, I'm giving you wealth, I'm going to give you, but it, it basically Hashem was uh, uh, excited that he asked for such a uh, important uh, thing, for, uh, selfless in a certain sense, he didn't care for his own enjoyment of money or uh, uh, other things, but he really just wanted or go, you know, uh, but he, he really wanted wisdom to be able to uh, service his community, service his people. And uh, Hashem gave him and he gave him that. But uh, so that was the first vision. And now Hashem appears to him a second time. Um, there was another time that we did have Hashem uh, appearing to, uh, there was some type of word Hashem gave to Shlema Amelech, but uh, that we don't consider full-fledged prophecy either. It wasn't Hashem directly giving his prophecy to uh, to Shlema. Hashem spoke to a prophet or uh, it was a lower level of prophecy. But here, this is considered the second time, meaning this was also prophecy. So Hashem appeared to Shlema a second time as he appeared to him at Givain. And Hashem said to him, I have heard your prayer and supplication and uh, uh, and that, that you supplicated before me. I've sanctified this temple that you have built to place my name there forever and my eyes and my heart shall be there all the days. The Hebrew, my eyes and my heart shall be there all the days. And so uh, what this uh, verse is telling us, again, we're verse three, is that uh, Hashem is basically saying that, the, yeah, I, I heard your, your request and uh, the house is uh, sanctified. I've sanctified it. Uh, my name is there. Always be there. I, I did want to mention there is a famous uh, medrash where uh, the... Uh, the Roman general had uh, uh, asked, he, he uh, commanded four of his officers to destroy the Temple Mount, the wall around the Temple Mount. And so three of them listened and they destroyed the three walls around the, the Temple Mount. But the fourth one refused. He didn't do it. And so the... Roman emperor of Vespasian, he, uh, or the general, I should say, he came and uh, told him, he said, why didn't you listen to my, uh, to my command? You're going to get killed. And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, I wanted it to look good for you that how you were able to uh, destroy these solid walls, how thick they were, how tall they were. So if I left one up, people will be able to say uh, this is how big the others were. It'll show your greatness and um, it'll, it'll, it'll show your power. You were able to demolish such, I mean, if anyone's been there to the base, to the uh, place, to the, to the uh, Western wall, you, you've probably seen the, the size of those uh, stones. There must be thousands and thousands of, of pounds and uh, to destroy it is uh, you know, not easy. And so uh, so he said, I left it up in order to show honor to you that people will see how you know how thick it was and how uh, how uh, uh, hard it was to uh, to destroy. So Vespasian said that you will be punished and even so and uh, um, and uh, he, of course, he had him killed. But it turns out that they never destroyed the fourth wall. And that's why we still have it there today. The Western Wall was the one wall that Vespasian did not succeed in destroying. 
in the year uh, 70, when the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, they were not able to destroy that fourth wall. And uh, basically, uh, it's a symbol that, uh, you know, Hashem's presence is is resting in the Beis HaMikdash forever. Rabbi? Yes. Do you know what's behind that wall? Is there a filler? Was it filled up? Or, or is it still a, a wall from both sides? I have no idea. I, oh. I, we're not really supposed to go behind it. Right. So I, I never looked behind it, but but I'm thinking, you know, if it was a wall from the Beit Amigdash. No, it's not the Beit Amigdash. It's a wall around the Temple Mount. Oh, okay. So, so that's, the, that's not the Beit Amigdash wall. They increase the flat area by adding that wall. So if you took that wall out, some of the dirt, you know, the there's a mountain. Just, there's a mountain yes. behind it. That's where the Temple Mount. No, but they yeah. filled in to to enlarge the flat area on top. Uh huh. Yeah. So maybe that's what it is. It's not open. Well, the Arabs do have access over. There. Yeah, yeah. But the uh, but for Jewish people to go there is not is not allowed because right. you have yeah. to have a certain level of purity to walk in the Makayim Hamigdash in the place of Beis Hamigdash. To walk there with you know with with for a while they have... did for the while they did but when they were not allowed to pray the, then they found out they shouldn't go and, you know, mm -hmm. the so thing. there are people who seem to go there I'm not really sure what their um, leniency is but I was uh, always under the uh, understanding that uh, we're not allowed to go there because we are tame we're impure. And until right. the base of Mikdash, until we have the Parah Duma, the red heifer to purify us, we are not allowed to go there. But uh, anyway, so that's the story about, uh, you know, the Shechina being there all the days. Now, uh, that's uh, verse 3. My eyes and my heart is there all the days. And uh, verse four is, and as for you, if you walk, um, that actually, actually, what that 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 pasuk, that that the shechina is still there. That is actually the the meaning that we can't walk there. You know, it's because it's it's there. Kol hayamim all the days. The last the last words in, in verse uh, uh, three is. Uh, yeah, but if the Shechina is there, why are the Arabs allowed to walk there? They're not allowed. They're doing no, no. it. They do. They don't follow rules. They're not supposed to follow our rule. They but don't. They, they see don't. To it that they are not allowed to walk there. Well, that would be very nice. I wish the Israeli government would listen to you. Yeah. They shouldn't okay. be anywhere. Right. <laughs> Anywhere near. <laughs> only, only in hell. So uh, verse 4, And as for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, with wholeheartedness and with uprightness, and do, to do in accordance with all that I've commanded you, you will observe my decrees and my statutes, then I shall uphold the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I spoke to you your, about your father David, saying, No man of yours will be cut off from upon the throne of Israel. <laughs> but if you and your children turn away from me and will not observe my commandments, my decrees that I have placed before you, and you go and worship the gods of others and prostrate yourself to them, in verse 7, then I will shall cut off Israel from upon the face of the land that I gave them. The temple that I have sanctified for my name, I shall dismiss my, from my presence, and I shall become a parable and a conversation piece among all the nations. So uh, basically, Hashem is telling us about the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash. That there is, uh, you know, although it's just being built, it's just finished being built, Hashem is saying, if you don't take care of it, um, so the temple um I, that I have sanctified, I shall dismiss from my presence. Basically, uh, uh, 
the Beis Hamikdash will be destroyed. Um, now, verse number eight. Uh, it continues and says, in this temple, which will be so exalted, um, all who pass by it will be astonished and will whistle, and they will say, why did Hashem do such a thing to this land and to this temple? It's interesting that it uses the future word. It will be the house, uh, this temple, which they which will be so exalted. Why is it using the future so uh, one of the commentaries here just mentions that um, it it's, uh, really means the past tense and somehow some the, sometimes the future tense is, um, uh, is, is put there, even though it really refers to the past. And uh, the house that was the uh, exalted um, and important will be destroyed and everyone will be surprised about its destruction. So the house that was exalted. So it's a little surprising. Why does it use really the uh, the, uh, the 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 past tense? But um, the uh, the verse continues, and it says. Uh, and they will say, because they forsook Hashem, their God, who brought their forefathers out of the land of Egypt, and they grasped the God of others and prostrated themselves to them and worshipped them, and therefore Hashem brought this all this evil upon them. So this is why it's destroyed. It's because it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's because we have uh, forsaken Hashem. And as we all know, that that's why the uh, destruction of the Beis Hamikdash happens. Now, uh, verse number 10, and it happened at the end of 20 years during which Shlomo built the two buildings, the temple of Hashem and the king's palace. And we all know that the Beis Hamikdash took seven years and the palace took 13 years, almost double. And uh, so when he finished uh, building these two uh, buildings, so uh, it says Hiram, the king of Tyre, Tsar, the king of Tsar, had supplied Shlomo with cedar trees and cypress trees and gold according to his desire. And King Shlomo gave him, gave Hiram, 20 cities in the land of Galilee. And this is also very interesting because in the book of uh, Chronicles, it mentions the opposite, that Hiram gave Shlomo 20 cities. And here it says Shlomo gave Hiram 20 cities. And... Um, uh, verse 12 says, Hiram left to see the cities that Shlomo had given him, and they were not acceptable in his eyes. And he said, what are these cities you've given me, my brother? He called them the land of Kabul. Literally, Kabul means, uh, the, the Hebrew word, um, it means shackles, uh, which is its name to this day. Hiram sent the king 120 talents of gold. So what exactly is going on here? Number one, we've got this contradiction. Number two, we have Hiram is angry, this gift that David, that Shlomo gives him, but then he goes and gives him another gift. So just uh, a few questions, but uh, yes, Mordechai. Oh, a couple of verses back where it said about that nothing was in the Aaron except uh, for the Luchars. Isn't there also a tradition? You're, you're about, about that... you're, wait, wait, you're talking about chapter eight, I think. No, chapter nine. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, oh yeah, oh, that's Hiram. Okay, fine. Okay, f forget the question. I'm I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. No problem. Okay. So, uh, uh, so so how do we uh, reconcile these contra this contradiction? So the thing is, what actually happened is it, 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 it really is more questions to ask because Shlomo Hamelach was not supposed to be giving away land, uh, from Israel, to anyone. What's he do doing? I mean, it's very nice that he has this good relationship with Hiram, and Hiram was giving him a lot of wood. But still, you're not supposed to give. Uh, we're not supposed to give land to uh, 
you know, we're not to to to, to non-Jews to uh, to uh, to watch them call it to uh, have a location in Eretz Yisrael. I mean, it's not uh, you know, it's just uh, we, as we know ourselves. We we, we saw what happened with this uh, land. Uh, you give you give uh, from people from other nations land uh, in our in our territory. How dangerous it is. Um, but the thing is, what 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 was going on here, according to one opinion, is that Shlomo HaMelech had made a deal that he was going to provide uh, grain for Chiram, because Chiram, although you know he had a lot of uh, trees in his area, it seems like that it was hard for them to grow grain. And uh, Shlomo HaMelech said, here, you, here's a land. Why don't you try to develop it? And uh, you'll have it for grain. This is at least one of one of the uh, interpretations. And so, um, so Hiram uh, uh, looked at the land and says, "What do you mean? <laughs> Going to grow, grow grow grain over here? This is the worst land ever. We can't grow anything. This land is uh, is worthless." And um, and, and therefore. Um, um, uh, he gave it back to him. He says, uh, "I mean, he gave it back to him. He never got. He never was given it really in the first place. It was more for usage, utilitarian purpose, uh, and not really as a gift, but just as a. Uh, uh, he was, you know, he was gonna uh, be able to benefit from the uh, from the heart from harvesting the grain, but he couldn't uh, because he didn't know how to grow anything there. He didn't believe it could grow, so." Uh, in the end, um, you know, David, uh, Shalom Amalek, uh, you know, took the land back, and uh, we uh, had other people develop it. And uh, the, the the there there is another way of understanding this, and that is that they both Shalom and Chira both traded land with each other, and uh, the the, the uh, Shalom Amalek was was actually nervous um, that. Hiram might take the land if he gives it yeah, land. So he did it in a way that he was hoping that Hiram wouldn't want it. So he gave him these lands that were all mud, un, unusable. And uh, ultimately, Hiram wasn't really uh, uh, interested in these lands. So he gave them back because, you know, he realized uh, that it's not, it was uh, basically worthless to him. And, uh, and so Shlomo accomplished what he wanted to, which was to offer him something, but then get it back. In the meantime, Hiram gave Shlomo land, and we actually sent Yidin to, to live in, in Hiram's area and uh, populate it. They, gave, they each gave each other 20 cities. So that's the, uh, that's the understanding, at least, of, the, of one of the commentaries here. The Radak explains it this way. And... Um, and uh, so at least he, they, you know, they traded 20 cities for 20 cities, but in the end, uh, we got the, we, we got the, the better uh, uh, half of the gift because we, uh, we kept the land. Uh, on the other hand, Hiram didn't want to, anything to do with it. It was what, what we called shackles. Why was it called shackles? Because whoever stepped on it, you felt like you were shackles being pulled down. The mud would just pull you, pull you in. And so it was uh, almost dangerous, I guess. And um, uh, so, so this is, uh, 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 you know, the the, uh, the the understanding of why Hiram didn't want it. But at the same time, Hiram then gave a gift to Shlomo HaMelech. Why did he give this gift? He gave a gift to Shlomo HaMelech because uh, he didn't want it to look like he's angry. So he... Uh, uh, yeah, so he gave him uh, 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 this, uh, and I was—he wanted to look also like uh, I hope you're not angry that I'm giving you back your land. So he gave him a gift with it, and he sent 120 talents of gold. Now uh, there is another interpretation that he wanted to say: Ah, oh, you gave me something that's. Uh, uh, worthless. I'm going to give you something that's really good. It's a certain way of uh, showing off, like uh, to, you know, it's a, so it's, it's like a re, uh, 
an element of revenge there. You know, you gave me something bad, but I, I'm I'm going to show you what's good. I'm going to give you something good. You know, and uh, so that's that's another way of uh, interpreting it. Um, so either he was in, he thought he might be insulted, so he gave him he gave him this gift, or he uh, he was uh, you know sort of like taking revenge uh, by uh, saying, "Ah, oh, look at me, I'm I'm much better than you." But um, uh, anyway, what happened here is Hiram uh, sent the king these hundred and twenty talents of gold. Uh, now we're up to verse fifteen, and uh, it says over here that this is a description of the levy that King Solomon imposed to build the temple of Hashem in his palace. Uh, the Milo in the wall of Jerusalem. Um, let me just read the Hebrew over here. Libnais is Beis Hashem, that's Beisai, his house, meaning the house, the the, the, the the temple of Hashem and his palace, and meaning Shlomo's palace. And the Milo, Milo is this uh, area that's sort of like a, a landfill. Milo, Milo just means a filler. But uh, commentaries all discuss what, what exactly land this was. Uh, they basically say that, it, that it, it's a piece of land that people who would come from all far away lands to Israel, to Jerusalem, to to uh, celebrate the holidays, so they would pitch tent over here in this land called the Milo. But uh, Shlomo HaMelech decided he's going to build it up. And uh, the only thing is, he didn't build it up for the people. He ended up building it for his new wife, this daughter of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And uh, Shlomo Melech uh, builds her uh, her own palace, and then he builds her uh, this Milo in order for all of her all of her uh, uh, workers and her maids. And so he he built up this uh, this place called the Milo. He also built up the Chaimas Yerushalayim, the wall of Jerusalem. Shlomo and the reason he did that about the Milo. What is that? Shlomo said something. I mean, David, King David said that he built his house by the Milo. Because he couldn't build it in Jerusalem, but he could build it by the Milo next to Jerusalem. Well, it was part of the city of David, maybe at the edge. Yeah, that, that's what I mean, yeah. Um, but uh, the commentaries uh, talk about it. They call it a uh, place. Be'ir, Rashi says it was in the city of David. And yeah. uh, it, it was filled with Afar. Milo means filled. So yeah. I guess Rashi's trying to, to fit it into the word. He says it was filled with Afar, with uh, earth. That's and what I thought they did by the, a, by the Western wall too. But there, there is another interpretation that, that it was filled with water. Um, so there is a, a different alternative uh, way of, uh, um, but you're right. It, it is mentioned in Shmuel base, but uh, right. it seems like Shlomo Hamelach like built it up now, and he, what he ended up doing was giving it to the daughter of Pharaoh, and uh, the rabbis were not so happy that he did this because, right. or the uh, the understanding is it wasn't really right because he took this community land. And uh, was using it for the daughter of Pharaoh. You know, yeah. Uh, it, it, it was used for people who needed a place when they came for the pilgrimage for the high holidays. In any event, um, uh, Shlomo HaMelech did this and he also built the wall of Jerusalem. And uh, it mentioned that David Amelech had built some type of wall, um, or he built up Jerusalem until the Milo. And here it says that Shlomo Hamelech uh, had extended the city. And um, uh, and so now he's building this bigger wall. 
around the city. Um, and then it mentions these other cities that are not really close by. It mentions uh, the city of Chatzor and the city of Megiddo and the city of Gezer. Now, in verse 16, it mentions uh, how they got this city of Gezer. It says, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had come up and conquered Gezer, burnt it in fire and killed the Canaanites who lived in the city. And he gave it as a wedding present to his daughter, Solomon's wife. And then Solomon then built it up. And uh, lower the lower, lower Bescharon, uh, the, uh, uh, the Balas, Balas, that's that city, and Tadmar, the Midbar, Baretz. So he, uh, um, um, it was at the edge of the land right by the desert. So it was, uh, it was near populated land. Uh, they, that's the way they translate it. But it means is by mid Barbaret, it was by the edge of the populated uh, area. So uh, Shlomo Melch was building up these cities. And um, uh, the, uh, the story here is that there obviously were Canaanites that were living in uh, is still in Israel at this time. And it has to do with the fact that the Jewish people, they never fully got rid of the enemies. And this was uh, considered a mistake on their part. They should have gotten rid of the enemies. They didn't. And uh, Shlomo HaMelech does something interesting here. We'll soon see that he actually hires them. That This is the... the, the, uh, the um, the tax that he's placing on them, that he uh, he uh, has them work for him, and um, and they have to build these cities. Now, uh, so he built Anna, up the. Anna, I see you muted, but I you know that your picture is sideways. So the uh, verse that we're up to is... Uh, that's better. That's good. No, you went too far. That's good. <laughs> okay, thank you. All, no, all you're the, normal. All the storage cities that Shlomo had, and the chariot cities and the cavalry cities, uh, and every luxury of Shlomo that he wished to build in Jerusalem and in the Lebanon and in the land of his dominion. So uh, Shlomo built all these up. He, he had these uh, areas that he wanted to uh, uh, use for all different types of purposes. Um, uh, there is a translation here, already miskinized, that it means the mis miskane means like someone who's uh, poverty stricken or uh, that he built up these poverty stricken cities and uh, he built them just like he built the, 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 the big cities. He built, the, he built up the, uh, the small cities and uh, that would be one translation. They translate it here as the storage cities, which is another translation of the same word. But there is a commentary that translates it as the uh, the poor cities. And uh, and uh, he built all he built up all these cities, uh, Jerusalem and um, and the Lebanon. Lebanon was like a forest nearby that area, and uh, the land of his and uh, in, in the land of his dominion. He was building up uh, the areas. Now, all the people who were left from the Emory, the Chiti, the Prizi, the Chivi, and the Yavusi, who were not of the children of Israel, their descendants who were left after them in the land and whom the children of Israel were not able to eradicate, Shlema conscripted them as indentured laborers until this day. So here we see what he's doing with them which is interesting that um, that Shlomo doesn't want to destroy them now. You know, it's interesting what what he should have done. Uh, uh, it, was this was this appropriate, or should he have destroyed them? Because in Torah, normally we're not really supposed to let them. We're not supposed to let them live, uh, and there seems to be an argument among the commentaries on the Torah. Uh, to what extent are we uh, like if they do want to accept the seven Noahide laws, are we allowed to accept them or not? 
And uh, one of the commentaries says, yes, you would be allowed to, but uh, not everyone agrees with that. Uh, but here, maybe Shlem HaMelech follows, seems to follow that view. And uh, he's uh, he's not killing them. Instead, he's just going to have them work. And he puts them to work. And, and they're going to be building up these, uh, these areas. Uh, you know, we should have gotten rid of them before when they refused to accept the Noahide laws, but now they uh, they uh, are coming around and they're accepting the Noahide laws and uh, Shlema is, uh, is keeping them. I think that's what Joshua did with the Kaini, didn't he? When they Joshua came, did to, to, the, to the Givonim. 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 Yeah, Givonim. So, uh, yeah, so this is the uh, the story of Shlema dealing with these uh, with these people that were still that were there from before and should have been eradicated long ago. And uh, then it tells us then verse 22, but Shlema did not enslave anyone of the children of Israel, but they were the men of war. They were his servants, commanders and officers, the commanders of his chariots and his riders. So. Uh, interesting that it uses this term they were the men of war we know Shlomo didn't have any wars but uh, he used the Jews to be his his soldiers not to build now the Jews are not meant to be uh, to be the construction workers but uh, uh, at least uh, at least uh, Shlomo didn't feel that way and uh, he you know he did that he did have them uh, as men of war soldiers and he had them as servants commanders officers commander of his chariots and his riders but he security. did not have them what security security right he had them as security people but uh but he didn't have them he didn't in, 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 he didn't have them uh, do the construction work and um and these were the commanders of his commissioners who were in charge of the work for Solomon 550 men who directed the people doing the work so the the, the, uh, the the people who were in charge uh, were these 550 men, but there were many, many thousands of workers. And um, uh, verse number 24, however, Pharaoh's daughter went up from the city of David to her house, that's Alma bid for her, and then he built up the Milo. So uh, verse 24 is emphasizing that uh, Shlomo HaMelech had built uh, this uh, built this house for the daughter of Pharaoh. But the problem was she had all these maids and workers. So he, he basically needed to build her another location as well. And that was the, the purpose of his using this Milo to, uh, uh, to have for her maids and for her workers she must have been a real character this daughter of pharaoh she wasn't just sitting back i guess she was always inviting people and uh outsiders i guess and uh, she needed she had a lot going on um and uh, shlima didn't like the idea that uh the daughter that that the daughter of pharaoh uh will have a location right inside the city of David. So he wanted it to be more at the edge or outside the city. And uh, and uh, and so he he basically built her a palace over there. And uh, very interesting, this whole topic of him marrying this daughter of, of Pharaoh. You know, how was he allowed to even do this? Uh, you have to understand that the daughter of Pharaoh is considered a... Uh, a Mitzri, an Egyptian. Egyptians are not allowed to uh, convert. Even if they convert, they're not allowed to marry a Jew. A, a Jew is not allowed to marry an Egyptian um, uh, until the third generation. And so, what exactly was he uh, was he doing marrying this uh, daughter of the Egyptian king, uh, Bas Para, the daughter of Pharaoh? Uh, different commentaries talk about it. It was either this was a marriage. Uh, he, he, 
it, it, it was a, it was a, this was a concubine. Maybe uh, uh, there is such a thought that maybe uh, uh, Shlom Hamelch felt uh, followed one opinion in the Talmud that the women uh, are allowed to marry the first generation converts of the of the Egyptians. It's only the the men you can't marry till the third generation. There is there is such a view. We don't. We don't follow it according to halacha, according to Jewish law, the final law. But in the time of Shlomo HaMelech, maybe that was a, a, you know, the accepted view or was a possible view before the rabbis finally uh, confirmed what the final verdict was. So there is such a view. So there's some want to say maybe Shlomo felt, felt that way. Or others want to say maybe he never really got married to her, fully married. It was only by Yisra, it was only like... A, a, the first part of marriage, it was like an engagement. It wasn't really a, you didn't actually get married. Um, commentaries all discuss this whole thing. But uh, what's also interesting is that the um, the uh, in verse uh, uh, sixteen, where it says Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, came up and conquered Gezer, and so he like conquered one of these cities in Eretz Yisrael. He burnt it, killed the Canaanites who lived there, and gave it as a wedding present to his daughter. So. There's this concept here. We see that uh, like uh, Shlomo didn't want it, was or was not allowed to be a man of war, so he didn't go to war. Maybe, maybe that had something to do with uh, him not destroying these uh, enemies because uh, or making a war because Shlomo is not supposed to be a man of war. He's he's building Beis Hamikdash, and uh, he sort of uh, uh, doesn't want to ruin that uh, title of his. And uh, but his but Pharaoh, father, his father lost it because of that. His right, father that, wanted to build the base in Migdash and was told you can't. So he knew already what he shouldn't do. But the question is, once the base of Migdash is built already, you know, well, does does the does is Shlomo still worried? About not uh, going to war, is that is that connected with this? But we see what happened. Paroi himself went to war for the Jewish people. You know, he goes to war and he destroyed the the, the enemies in that city. So it was like, uh, you know, have Paroi do it, and uh, Shlomo didn't have to get his hands dirty, and Paroi gave it to his uh, to his daughter as a uh, uh, a wedding gift, so to speak, or a. Uh, uh, a dowry. Yes, uh, uh, Ben. Yeah, I wanted to say that Shlomo married some of the women to keep peace on the border. So I think Egypt right. was one of them and there were other people because he figured that's the way to keep it from getting into a war. Right, right. So. Definitely, that that, that was his intention. Yeah, but the, the, nevertheless, that's why he gave question, gifts to Sidon, and they gave him gifts. He, he he didn't want to get into a war with anybody, so he he was smart enough to to make deals, you know, without getting into a war. Right, but the thing is, you have to keep in mind that that doesn't uh, necessarily allow him to do something that's uh, that's prohibited in Jewish law, like marrying an Egyptian. Yeah, so maybe maybe it it, it was a, not a full marriage of some kind. Right, I'm just saying. So you still have to come on to some other. Right. That that that, that yeah, that's that's what he's he he has in mind. But it, it still doesn't uh, yeah, it doesn't uh, exactly explain um, what his what his goal. It doesn't explain what allowed him to do it. Uh, in addition to the fact that we know also that in the time of Shlomo, we weren't accepting um, any converts anyway. The massacre that happened. We weren't... Uh, right, because he was so successful. We weren't, uh, because everything was so good for the Jewish people then, so we weren't really supposed to be accepting converts, and yet he himself is converting uh, con converting, uh, yeah, converting people. Um so anyway, these are things. Uh, some things that they that the commentaries uh, discuss at length. We're we're up to uh, uh, verse uh, uh, twenty-five. Uh, so it says three times a year, Shlomo uh, Melech had elevation offerings and peace offerings brought upon the altar that he had built for Hashem, and had incense burned on the other uh, altar that was. 
with it before Hashem, and he completed arrangements of the temple. So the uh, verse 25 is basically um, uh, emphasizing how um, th there was the Mizbeach HaZahav, the golden altar, and um, uh, th that's the uh, the, the mizbeach that the uh, incense was 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 uh, was uh, burned on, and um, it's called the mizbeach that's before Hashem. If you look at the verse again, the uh, the incense burned on the other altar that was with it before Hashem. Uh, so that that's that one was uh, inside the holies. The first altar was not inside the holies. It was outside of the uh, Hechel, outside of the holies. So that altar was where they brought the elevation offerings and the peace offerings. The other altar was the altar that the incense was burned on, and that was uh, inside the Kodesh, inside the holies. And so uh, uh, there were three times a year that he had all these uh, uh, huge amount of sacrifices that were um, that were brought from all those that were traveling to Jerusalem. Now, uh, this doesn't mean that he didn't supply everything else. He supplied also the daily stuff and the the Shabbos stuff and the, and the. Uh, uh, but but in addition to that, he also you know he supplied the uh, holiday stuff as well. Now the uh, verse continues and it says that King Solomon made a fleet in Etzion Gover uh, could mean a fleet, it could mean a ship. And which is near Alos or Elos on the coast of the Red Sea, the Yamsuf, or the Reed Sea, in the land of Edom. And uh, Hiram sent in the fleet his servants, shipmen who knew the sea together with Shlema's servants. And they came to Ophir and took gold from, from there. They took gold from there and 420 talents and brought them to King Shlema. So Shlema Melech. He's uh, very interesting about he's trying to gather all this wealth. And the goal that he has is to make it to, to impress the world. And they will see uh, how great Hashem is. And the, the, the goal can only be accomplished if Shlema HaMelech is uh, subservient to Hashem and constantly emphasizing Hashem and everything he does. And uh, that's what Shlomo does, really. That's what he wanted the Beis Hamikdash as well to to be the when they came and they would see the Beis Hamikdash, that would create the backdrop of everything else that they saw. They would understand that it's all connected to the fact that the Beis Hamikdash is behind all of this. It's all Hashem's dwelling. This is all about Hashem. It's not about my brains. It's not about my greatness, my honor my glory, my uh, decision-making, its its it all boils down to Hashem. And so he's creating that uh, with all of his wealth and um, uh, the the uh, buildings that he's building, and the uh, Beis Hamikdash itself, it all boils down to Hashem behind everything. Now, where is this place where he's getting all this gold from? If I if I tell you, I'm afraid you won't want to stay as part of the uh, program, the Retiree Academy, you'll start selling gold. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I should really <laughs> say, but uh, Ofer, Ofer is, some say it means Peru. Uh, other other options is Ethiopia, and uh, there seem to be a few interpretations of where this where this uh, Ophir really is. But um, 
Right now you can find it at Costco. <laughs> <laughs> they are selling they are selling gold bars. Yeah, right now. Gold bars? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Like a chocolate with the chocolate bars? They decided <laughs> to sell gold bars. No, it's ah. serious. So, uh, wow, wow. That's interesting. I didn't know uh, you could get they that. I just heard it on the radio on the way home. Uh -huh. If anyone buys any, that would be uh, interesting to. Uh, 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 yes, uh, Mordechai. Yeah, isn't there a Gomorrah somewhere where it lists like seven different types of gold, uh, like uh -huh. and like according to the level of quality or whatever? And I, I think I believe one of them is Ophir gold. Interesting. Uh huh. I it wonder if that's the, the, the highest quality because we we were constantly mentioning that Shalom Hamelach was getting the highest quality and that that uh, no one else could sell any of their gold when when Shalom Hamelach got this gold because uh, Shalom's gold was of such uh, you know the best quality uh, that uh, the, not, not all the other gold stores had to close down. Because uh, no one, no one would want to buy any other gold except this. Let me mute everyone. One second, I'm muting everyone so we can hear each other. Okay, does someone want to say something, or should I continue? Uh, okay, so the uh, so Ophir, yeah, so the the different the uh, the west coast of Africa, um, you know, it's that that that, that seems like. Uh, uh, he 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 found the place where there was like a, a large amount of gold, and he also knew. Well, I, I'm just guessing that it may, maybe people didn't really live in these areas, and it wasn't really uh, habitable. But uh, so, but because he was able to travel, he had this big ship that was safe, so he had access to uh, to the this gold, and he felt if he brought it. Uh, to his, uh, uh, you know, to Eretz Yisrael, this would be great um, um, honor for Hashem. It would be a, um, a you know, a Kiddush Hashem in all of his, uh, in, 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 in uh, people realizing that the blessings are all here. The blessings are all in uh, with the Jewish people. Now, uh, uh, the bottom, the, the end of this uh, chapter said he took gold from their 420 talents. And uh, they make a calculation here that it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, they don't say exactly, but uh, somewhere many millions of dollars. Uh, and they also say that there seems to be a contradiction between here where it says 420 talents and uh, what it says in the book of Chronicles that it says 450 talents. They say it must have been that there were 30 talents that they had to pay for the cost of the journey. So even though they maybe brought more gold back, but that all went to the cost of the journey. So it ended up they only had a net profit of 420 talents of gold. Okay, and now we're up to ver uh, chapter 10. And chapter 10 is an interesting chapter about the queen of Shiva, Malkas Shiva. And uh, in English, it's the queen of Sheba. But in the Hebrew, it's Shiva, the, the queen of Shiva. Uh, she heard of Solomon's fame, that it was for the name of Hashem. And she came to test him with riddles. So she starts off straight out that, yes, I know that it's all about Hashem, that uh, uh, Hashem, you know, everything that you do is all, you're always acknowledging it's from Hashem. And uh, and she came with these riddles. Now, uh, the Medrash does talk about what the riddles were and what type of riddles she uh you know what type of riddle did she uh, did she did did she test uh, um, uh, Shlomo with? Like one of the riddles it says was that she had a group of uh, children and uh, they were all around the same 
uh, height, same age, identical clothing, same hairstyle, same everything. And uh, she said, tell me which one are boys and which ones are girls. And Shlomo HaMelech had to figure out, you know, uh, without being, with, without, you know, they all wore the same clothes. So, you, she, you know, it wasn't obvious. And so he asked the servants to distribute among the uh, uh, these children, nuts. So they all had their their uh, nuts. I don't know, maybe almonds or some. And they had to crack nuts. their nuts. Now they had to crack them, and they he watched the children how they did it. So the boys stuffed the nuts inside their garments. And the girls wrapped them in some type of uh, handkerchief or uh, some type of, sh of shawl. And so the uh, Shlom HaMelech said, look, now you can see who's a boy and who's a girl. You know, so uh, the, um, the, 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 uh, the queen was quite impressed. And uh, then she said, well, here's another test. And she says, group of men some of them were circumcised some of them aren't tell me who's what who's who who's circumcised and who isn't so shlema melech he brought them in front of the uh the uh and uh which is the um uh, i'm sorry i brought them in front of the ark and the ones that were circumcised were able to stand. The ones that were that were not circumcised, they fell, so they couldn't handle the uh, the holiness, so to speak. And uh, uh, someone else said, "Here, you see." So the queen said, "How do you know? Where do you uh, get this knowledge? How do you know how to do this?" And uh, he said, "Well, uh, he said, I." I know it from the Torah because it says that um, when Bilam would get his prophecy, uh, meaning that God's divine presence would uh, would speak to him, he would always fall. So uh, the reason he would fall, he wasn't able to handle it because he wasn't circumcised. So Shalom uh, Melech said, I, that's how I know that, uh, that I knew this trick would work if I put them in front of the ark the ones that are uncircumcised won't uh, wouldn't be able to uh, to stand which is actually interesting because if a non-jew was circumcised uh, it, like does that make does that make him be able to stand like if Bilam would have circumcised himself it's an interesting uh, question you know he's still not jewish so would the, the actual he's circumcising himself or does somebody have to circumcise him Whatever, however it is, but would it would it would, would it work? Would it actually work if they were circa if a non Jew the Ishmaelites? Ishmaelites the question, yeah. Ishmaelites, um, uh, you know, have Mila. Well, uh, the uh, the 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 story was these people were Malka Shiva. they weren't Ishmaelites. Yeah, yeah. so that's uh, she she must have brought them along. So they, they uh, but uh, okay, that's the that's the story. We're gonna stop here. We will to be continued. Zaygazunt, have a great day. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Where you, Rabbi. his Egyptian problem started. <laughs>